I'm Afshin Samali, Professor of Cancer Biology and the Director of Apoptosis Research Center at NUI Galway. Many of my colleagues and students do not know about my background. And when I tell them I came here as a refugee, it's a great surprise to them. So let me tell my story, how I came to Ireland and how I got where I am today. I was born in Iran. I had a very happy childhood, but also I was always aware of the fact that we were different from others uh, in that uh, we are members of the Baha'i faith, which is a religious minority in Iran. And it has been always persecuted in the country. We believe that God's revelation to mankind is progressive in that uh, he sends different messengers, different prophets at different times for the need of the time. It has as its principal establishment of an international language to help bring the world together. So the core principles or the core objective of Baha'i faith is peace and unity. The country that you love and you want to stay there, enjoy yourself with the family. We had a good time because uh, Afshin's father was a doctor and we had a lovely house and we had the driver, we had the gardener, we had, they had the nanny, everything. And after he passed away, Afshin's father passed away and the revolution started. I used to be a teacher. I, I lost my job. And they said, unless you say, I'm not Baha'i, and I couldn't do that. Uh, we, saw, we lost the, every income because of our religion. Well, the Baha'i faith in Iran had been persecuted ever since its inception in 1844. There was efforts made to actually squash the Baha'i faith into non-existence by various means. There were a lot of executions, there were a lot of killings and tortures, and very bad things happened through the early 1980s. Also, kids were told they couldn't go to university unless they denied their faith. So there was many aspects to this. At the moment, there's a great deal of promoted hate speech against the Baha'is to try and blacken their names among the population. They believe Muhammad is the last prophet and Baha'u'llah came after Muhammad. They don't believe of that. And because in our religion, we have no priest. Whatever you study, you study yourself or whatever happened, you can connect yourself directly with God. You don't need somebody else to help you to do that. And uh, we have equality between men and women and for every uh, aspect, women uh, are really in top job and they do whatever they want. Uh, but before it wasn't in any religion uh, to uh, give a right to the woman. My stepfather was one of the leaders in the Baha'i community and he was wanted by the authorities. And if he had been arrested, he would have been imprisoned or even worse. Many of his colleagues were imprisoned and later executed. So it was in 1984 when my family decided to leave Iran. Uh, they sold all our belongings. They had to raise large sums of money to pay human smugglers to take us across the border from Iran to Pakistan. We took a plane from Tehran to a town called Chabahar on the Persian Gulf. It's one of the hottest spots in Iran. And you can imagine in June, summer heat, it was extremely hot and humid. 
there were two trucks there waiting uh, for us behind the palm trees and the metal uh, that we were sitting on was so hot because the trucks were sitting there in the sun for many hours. As soon as we got into the trucks, they took off very quickly and they drove across the desert and by nightfall we were in the mountains. And the trucks drove up the mountains on rocky paths that were barely as wide as the truck with very deep ravines uh, below. It took a very long time to cross the mountains and it was around midnight when we passed the border uh, into Pakistan. But we still didn't feel we were safe. Um, we were driving for a few hours in, in the Pakistani side of the, uh, the border when we were spotted by the Pakistani border patrol and they followed us. They chased us for, for a period of time and eventually the driver stopped and the border patrol got off his motorbike and pointed his gun at us. Immediately the armed smugglers jumped off the truck and pointed their guns at him too. It was very scary. I thought there was going to be a shootout and I could hear my mom and sister screaming. But luckily uh, both sides held their nerve and uh, they started talking and after a couple of hours of negotiations we were back on the truck uh, and on our way. It took us another two days before we arrived in Karachi in Pakistan and uh, we realized there that we had to go to Islamabad, the capital city in Pakistan, uh, to register with UNHCR. Uh, during our time in Pakistan, we lived, my whole family, we, with my aunt, six of us in a small room, in a house uh, shared with many other families. So they were in Pakistan and what was going to happen? In Little Ireland, the Irish Baha'i community wanted to contribute to this and offered to accept some Baha'is. This meant the government had to agree, of course. At that time, the only refugee groups which had come here were from Chile and from Vietnam. Very small groups. Ireland really fortress Ireland in a sense because there was unemployment and you were protecting the population from people taking jobs, all this kind of thing. However, after a great deal of toing and froing with government departments, in particular foreign affairs, which were extremely professional and very, very helpful, agreement was reached that 26 refugees could come from Pakistan to Ireland. Another thing that had been agreed was that these people would not all stay in, in, in some kind of ghetto situation. They would go to different towns and cities throughout Ireland. They had agreed that they would, and that's exactly what happened. Before coming to Ireland, I knew a little bit about Ireland from my school time. I had seen two pictures of Ireland in my school books. One was of O'Connell Street in Dublin, a photograph taken from the O'Connell Bridge back in the 70s, I believe. And the other one was of a, of a bog road in Connemara with sheep on uh, both sides of the, the road. So that was the image of Ireland I had when I arrived here. The day we arrived in Dublin, it was 3rd of December, 1985. Uh, it was, first of all, it was very cold. <laughs> oh, it was December, very cold day. And we have a very lovely, welcoming uh, group uh, from Baha'i community and from UN. So we, as a family, we went to Sligo and they help us the four children go to school, uh, find a house for us. Oh, people were so kind, so nice. So uh, no problem to welcoming us. And uh, really, I didn't get homesick at all. I must say, uh, actually, when we came to Ireland, 1980s, not many people will remember. It was a very difficult time in Ireland. There was a recession here in the country. Every family had members leaving the country, going to US, North America, to UK or Europe, Australia and elsewhere. 
and people were wondering why are we coming into a country where everyone is trying to leave. This gives a good example of Irish generosity that even during harsh economic conditions they are still open to welcome people here. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. In the UN Declaration of Human Rights uh, is enshrined the right to seek asylum in another country. Uh, but around the world what we find today is that often that right is now under attack like it never has been before. And this is despite the fact that we've always had refugees, we've always had wars, we've always had conflicts and people who've had to flee to other countries. And we have to just be cognizant of that today that, you know, people are leaving their homes for the same reasons and they still have the same rights as they did back in the 90s and 1980s when, you know, this hadn't been politicised as an issue and people really didn't have so much of an issue with people coming into their countries and seeking asylum. The history of Ireland is, is a history of refugees as well. We were refugees, so this university, NUI Galway, was built in the 1840s. And at that time, people left this country to go elsewhere. And so we were the people who are in, in that century, who are now are coming to us in this century. And I think it's incumbent on us to realise that they are as we were, they are, they are as we are. And for us to not welcome them here is in a sense to, to, to give a cold shoulder to our own ancestors, to our own history, that people who left here found a welcome. And we should also welcome people like us, and they are like us, who come here too. One of the biggest challenges is that when you open a newspaper or you look at the news on your TV uh, or you know you scroll through the news on your smartphone, uh, often what you see are images of people uh, you know crossing borders, whether it's the border between Belarus and Poland or it's you know in the Mediterranean and so on. And I think people often feel that you know they've lost control or that uh, there's no control on their borders and they can't stop people coming. But the thing is that the vast majority, almost nine out of every 10 refugees are in poor and developing countries. And um, quite a number have come to Europe, but for the most part, it is their neighboring countries that are supporting them. So I think that if we show that we're not able to do it, then these countries that have less abilities than us to do it, you know, they might feel that they won't do it either. So I think it's very important that we do show solidarity from that point of view. If I fled from my country because I'm not safe in my country, because I'm having, I couldn't work in that country. So I come to this country for find work and uh, be safe. And when I put my head down at night, I know that nobody knocked the door to get me and put me in prison. That's because I feel safe I'm here. Since childhood, I was fascinated by life. Uh, I was fascinated by the environment. I loved animals. Our house was like a zoo. I wanted to be a, either a zookeeper or a veterinarian. I always wanted to learn. I was always fascinated with, with science and learning. And to see the Baha'is in Iran do not have access to third level education, I didn't take anything for granted. So any opportunity I had, I took it and I worked very hard. So Afshin and I met in the lab, you know, through working on common projects and that led, one thing led to another, as they say. <laughs> we both went to Sweden, to the Karolinska Institute, where we um, did postdoctoral training. And after that, we're very fortunate we got lectureship positions, both of us, in NUI Galway. Um, in recent years, we've actually, we, we worked together a lot more than we did at the beginning. This was an opportunity for me to establish my, my own research program. It was an opportunity to start developing my ideas and to focus on precision oncology. All cancer patients are different. As such, one treatment that would fit all is not ideal treatment for individuals. So precision oncology is a tailoring treatment to individual cancer patients. We do have a very diverse community in terms of the nationalities where, where people are coming from and, you know, their different views on life. 
Even in our own research group, we have people from France, from Iran, Malaysia, uh, from Ireland, we're in the minority actually, from Poland. It's very diverse and it just adds, I think, to the vibrancy of the culture. When we welcome people to university, there's the sense that we teach, but we also learn. And I think a sense of diversity here for me also gives us a sense of not only welcoming people in, but those people also changing anyway, going away. Uh, and in a sense, it's not only a right uh, that they're here, but it's also right that they're here. And I think that really gives it, to me, is a very important part of how we see ourselves as a university, a very open place that's, that's willing to uh, share experiences in both ways. And that when Afshin came here, he has changed this place as well for the better. And I think that's a really important part of how I see uh, our role as a university. Every individual has the potential to grow and develop and uh, give something back to the society. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, says, regard man as a mind rich in gems of inestimable value. Education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom.